morning. Okay, today's reading is from Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 8 from verse 16 up to chapter 9, verse 12. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe the labor, there it is done on earth, people getting no sleep day or night. Then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. A common destiny for all. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the, and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take, to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil and there is madness in their hearts while they live. And afterwards, they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know, know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go, eat, eat food with gladness, and drink the wine with joyful heart. For God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your, your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love. All days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days, for this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, where you are going, there is neither waking, no planning, no knowledge, no wisdom. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not the swift, or the battle to the strong. Nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to, to, to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in their cold net, or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil, by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Here ends the reading. Now, there we go. Should I say all of that again? I'm Nick, and I'm kind of new here, so you might not know me. So if you don't know me, here I am, Nick. Uh, welcome to all of you who might be new, and to all of you who are returning. It's great to have you. Um, yeah, not, not the most uh, sort of joyful, leaping with excitement kind of passage that we read this morning. Uh, a cold, brutal dose of reality instead. Uh, so I hope you're ready. Uh, we have been following the teacher's journey through Ecclesiastes, the teacher or the preacher, or in Hebrew, the Kohelet, uh, this guy who goes about seeking out wisdom in all of life's experiences. And we've seen time and time again that he's an honest and a realistic kind of a person. He's taken his rose-colored glasses off, and he is taking an honest, sober look at all of the things that go on in our lives. Um, in fact, uh, he comes up with the fact that much of it, everything he examines, is like vapor. It's meaningless or vaporous, uh, he says. Vanity, vanity, or meaningless, meaningless, he says time and time again. He's very realistic and honest. Uh, so, one Bible scholar, or two of them, in fact, writing together, say, say this about the teacher, that when some terrific struggle, when this terrific struggle opened up in the teacher's life, he never ran from it. Uh, that's not what we find him doing in Ecclesiastes. He doesn't run away from all of these difficult experiences. He faced it head on, 
And this authentic embrace of the struggle laid the basis for ultimate resolution. So we find in this book time and time again the opportunity to face head-on, authentically and realistically, the struggle of our short existence on the planet uh, and to be honest about it and embrace the struggle uh, and come up with something on the other end, some sort of resolution. So this morning, two more observations from Ecclesiastes and from the teacher, and one, one way forward in making peace. Two more observations, and then one way forward in making peace with them. Can I pray? And we'll get going. Father in heaven, we, we ask that you would give us uh, the sanity and clarity of mind uh, to come to these truths uh, with, with reality and with authenticity and with ourselves. Uh, and we pray that as we take a good, cold, careful look at the experiences we go through in our lives under the sun, that we would come out the other side better for it. We pray your spirit would so move in our hearts and our minds uh, that we would be changed, a people with greater peace and joy and contentment in Christ. Amen. Um, a popular thing to do in our world is to have a look at a detective story, to watch or read a detective story. You know, there's so many popular ones. Maybe you liked uh, back in the day when it was still on TV. It's probably still on TV. Law and Order, Special Victims Unit. You can hear the TV going, dum dum. You know the sound? And, uh, or, may or maybe you liked CSI Miami. Uh, or one of those, those good old classics, Midsummer Murders, where the village is so small and there's so many episodes that everyone must surely have died like three or four times just to make more of them. Uh, or more recently on Netflix, you've, you've found something like Shetland or The Line of Duty. Uh, or there was a South African one made not so long ago that could keep you sweating at night called Devil's Dorp about this terrible cult in Krugersdorp that went around killing people for a little while. We love detective stories. Um, maybe, maybe you liked uh, Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie's novels. Wh but why? Why is it that detective novels or detective stories are so popular? If I may, they all follow basically the same plot line. There's never, I mean, they call it a twist, but it's a misnomer because there's a twist in every one. So, so they kind of predictable in a way. You know what's going to happen. There's going to be a crime and then there's going to be... Why? I'll tell you why we like them. It's because we like resolution. We like problems solved. So here's how the book goes or the story goes. Somebody is murdered and, and then you spend a lot of chapters wondering, oh my goodness, who did it? How are all these little loose ends going to fit together? What's going to happen? Who did it? Was it in the kitchen or in the lounge if you're playing Cluedo? And, and how could it ever have happened? And then the guy gets caught or the lady gets caught. Oh, thank goodness it was a terrible evil person and now they're locked up in jail. We can all breathe a deep sigh of relief. The world works again. <gasps> Everything's okay. The bad guy got caught. We love that resolution because there's something in our guts that says that's the way the world should be. Problems should be solved. Uh, life should be simple. Bad people should go to jail. And the system of the world should work and we should see how it works. That's, that's how life should be. Uh, that's how our guts tell us life should be. But Ecclesiastes, the teacher, tells us that life is in fact not like that. Life is incomprehensible. And if you don't know what that word means, you get it. Life is incomprehensible. Uh, look at chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. When I apply in my mind to know wisdom and to observe the labor that is done on earth, people getting no sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. Life is incomprehensible. 
He says, verse 17, no one can comprehend. No one. That means not the intelligent or the well-trained or the talented, not the rich or the hard-working, not the very spiritual or the very religious, not the successful. No one, he says, really comprehends what goes on in the world. Verse 17, despite all their efforts to search it out, that means it doesn't matter how hard you work to get at it. Even the teacher who go, who's been on this journey, that unimaginably vast journey, observing everything he can possibly observe about his life, not even he really understands. Even those efforts haven't gotten it right. The end of verse 17, even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. No amount of wisdom or intellect can really solve all the loose ends, answer all the questions, give you satisfaction that life is really as simple as you want it to be. Life's incomprehensible. So, uh, we experience this all the time. Perhaps you've been for counseling. Um, you know, you thought life was one thing, and you had it under wraps. And then something in you turned, or something happened to you, and life was no longer what you thought it would be, and you couldn't cope with it, and so you went to help. You went to an expert, a wise person, someone who's meant to understand the human condition. And if your experience was a normal one, and what you were looking for was a resolution or a solution, you would have left disappointed right? Because you don't, get, you don't get solutions. You don't get simplicity or answers uh, or resolution from counselors. Uh, they just help you through the muddle. Not even uh, the wisest of people uh, can help us to make sense of our lives and our experiences. Uh, look, at, look at the end of uh, our reading, verse 11. I've seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Look at those list of adjectives down the right uh, of that column, the swift, the strong, the wise, the brilliant, the learned. Those are meant to be the people who are successful. They're meant to be the winners and the victorious people. Those are the people you're meant to see on podiums and on stages and receiving prizes and huge cash payouts and whatever else we want in the world. Uh, but Ecclesiastes says, no, life's not that simple. The world isn't a simple system that you can understand and that just works. The race and the battle and the food and the wealth and the favor are not for people like that. Instead, <laughs> a lot of it comes down to chance, to time and to chance. Show me a successful person, and yes, sure, I'm sure they may have worked hard and they may have been very talented, but in the end, I bet you part of the ingredients of what made them so successful was luck. They got lucky. They were in the right place at the right time. Or they had a good idea that they didn't even realize how good it was. They just got lucky. That's how life works. Isn't it every mother's favorite saying? Every mother's favorite saying that life is not fair. <laughs> We tell our children that, but we battle to believe it ourselves. We battle to make peace with it ourselves. Uh, look at verse 12. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. You see... Nobody knows when trouble will come, and nobody knows where it will come from. Who could ever have guessed in November 2019 what kind of thing was going to come to us in March 2020? Who would ever have known where it would come from or how it would change our lives? I didn't, and you didn't, 
and nobody knew. It just came. Or perhaps you've had the terrible circumstance of having the dark clouds of depression pour misery into your brain. Where does that come from? I don't know. When does, like, who knows when that's going to happen next? It just happens. People are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. That's life. That's just how it works. Life is incomprehensible. We don't often get real resolution. There remains often mystery and questions. Often there are loose ends, painful loose ends. We live in a world where statements of doubt are just as appropriate as statements of fact. Where the world can't be tamed by technique and clever little tricks. We live in something like a maze. A maze which feels unsolvable because the solution is hidden from us. So how do we make peace with that? (laughs) How do we make peace with life's incomprehensibility, with the muddle of life? I'm going to flip in my Bible over to Romans chapter 1. Because the answer is that we make peace with it in Christ. Notice I don't say we solve all the riddles always in Christ. I say we make peace with it in Christ. Romans chapter 1 verse 17. For in it, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. You see, it's in the revelation that Christ gives that life that we can make peace with life's incomprehensibility. We cannot comprehend life. We can't think our way to knowing everything there, that we need to know about life under the sun. But Christ has come and revealed God to us. You see that? Verse 17, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. We didn't think our way into it. It was revealed in Christ. What is the righteousness of God? It's the attribute of God in Romans that causes him to save. He comes saving with his righteousness. So God is revealed in Christ as a righteous, saving God. And what else are we told? That this righteousness is by faith from first to last. In other words, you receive it by faith. Importantly in Romans, not by works, not by the things you do, not by your good deeds or your wrong deeds, but by trusting in Jesus Christ. Here's something that is revealed to us, the righteousness of God, something that can be known, you see, because Christ makes it known. The righteousness of God is made known to us. So there's one sure and firm thing revealed, God, and faith in God and His righteousness that saves us, that we can sit with in the maze of life. When we have so many questions and no answers and so many loose ends, we don't have to have them all solved, you see. We sit with them. Uh, We sit with them knowing that Christ has revealed God and His righteousness to us. So let me ask you an important question. Can your faith coexist with questions and loose ends and mysteries? It's a big question. Because perhaps there are questions and mysteries and loose ends that you will never know where they go. Or what their answer is. Can your faith endure those things? I want to reassure uh, this morning. Perhaps there are people who, here, I'm sure there are, I've no doubt about it, people who have very serious questions for God. Things you're upset about, things you don't understand. They might be very much to do with what you've experienced in life, or they might be intellectual. Things that don't make sense about the Christian faith. And perhaps you wonder if your experience of Christianity is a real experience, if indeed the Spirit has worked in your heart and you truly are a Christian, a faithful person, a person following Jesus. 
Well, I think something that Ecclesiastes tells us uh, as a whole, but especially in this passage, is that just like the teacher's faith was real as he had these big, serious questions, so the faith of a Christian with questions and doubts and mysteries in their life is very much genuine. See, big questions and loose ends in life don't mean your faith is not genuine. In fact, the most robust faith is the kind of faith that can tolerate them. That's how it is. Life's incomprehensible. But in Christ, in the revelation of God in Christ, we can make peace with that. Number two, life ends. Just when you thought it was going to get happy. Life ends. I imagine I probably hardly need to prove this to you uh, as a biological fact. Life ends. 100% of people die. That's how it works. You know that biologically. But I wonder if you know that of your life, if you've really considered that to be true of, of you, of me, I say to myself. Look at uh, verse 2 of Ecclesiastes 9. All share a common destiny, and we know what destiny he's speaking about. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. The point is that everybody dies. It doesn't matter how often you go to Virgin Active and how much revolting pureed kale you eat, you still die. It doesn't matter how good your medical aid scheme is, people die in Netke Mill Park Hospital and people die in Charlotte Matleke. Everyone dies. It doesn't matter how religious you are, how often you say your prayers and read your Bible, it doesn't matter what you think about higher powers. Everybody dies. That is simply a fact. Look at verse 3. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes us all. It just seems wrong. It seems an evil. Like something has unhitched in the world and everyone dies. It doesn't feel right to us. It's not meant to. But yet we will all die. Uh, look at verses 4 and 5. Everyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. That's a great proverb. For the living know when they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward and even their name is forgotten. Ecclesiastes has said that the living know very little, that life is incomprehensible. But here the living know something, they know they will die. That's a sad thing to think about, that the one thing we really know is that death is coming. Uh, but look at the next line, it's even sadder. The dead don't even know that. They're really dead. They know nothing. They have no further reward on earth. Nothing more will ever be given to them. And soon their reputation will go to the dust with them. Their name will be forgotten. Verse 6. No more do they experience any of those emotions. No more do they have relationships. And the world just moves on without them. Do you know, one day, that will be you and me. The world will just move on without us. Our reputations, our names will be nothing. It feels so wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry to break it to you. It's true. It's just true. Life ends. But look at verses 7 to 10. <laughs> Here's a plot twist. Go, eat your food with gladness. 
And drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, that is, wear the best clothes in your cupboard. And always anoint your head with oil, that is, don't save your perfume for another day, wear it today. Enjoy your life with your wife, whom you love all the days of this meaningless life God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days, for this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for in the realm of the dead where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. The surprise is as our teacher sees death, thinks about it, writes about it, he is actually filled with a kind of contentment and joyfulness and settledness. His life actually gains new meaning and purpose. <laughs> you see, here's the thing. Sometimes life takes you on a journey that shows you your mortality. You realize how fragile and short this thing is. Perhaps you've been there and you know what I'm talking about. And then one of two things happen. Either you become bitter and anger anger filled, angry, and frustrated uh, because life seems pitiful. Or you become more joyful and contented and purposeful. The teacher becomes more joyful and contented and purposeful. Why? How does he do that? And how do we do that? Well, to be honest, I don't know how he did it. He doesn't tell us very much. He just embraced it and made peace with it somehow. But how do we embrace it and make peace with it? And again, we do so in Christ, in Christ's resurrection. So on the screen will appear 1 Thessalonians 4, but you can turn there in your Bibles if you'd like. Uh, it's one of the earliest letters in the New Testament, uh, 1 Thessalonians. And what's happened is some Christians have died and the church is obviously really thrown by this. They weren't expecting it to happen. And so Paul writes, comforting them. I'm just going to read verses 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Just two things to notice. That those who die in Christ go to be with Christ. We believe that God will bring with Jesus. You see, they don't, they don't sleep like the rest of mankind. The end of verse 14, they have fallen asleep in him. The dead in Christ are with the Lord Jesus. Uh, that's what Christians expect to happen when we die. Uh, but look at the other wonderful part of it. The beginning of verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. In other words, there is resurrection. When Christ returns with all of His glory and His splendor to make the world new and reign forever on the earth, he will raise the dead in Him. He will bring them to be here on the earth and re resurrect them with Him. You see, we can begin to make peace with the fact that life ends when we believe that death is not actually the end for Christians. That those who have faith in Christ go to be with Jesus and return in resurrection with Him. When we see that death is more like a comma, than a full stop, and life is more than a journey to the grave. We begin to make peace with death uh, in Christ. Uh, so let, let's think about how this lands in our lives. I've had one of those experiences in my life um, where I realized that I was going to die. It wasn't very long ago. Seven months ago, uh, just a bit more, uh, Joe was born, our son, and his birth, uh, I'll use a euphemism, didn't go as anybody expected it to. These things seldom do. But this was spectacularly bad. Um, I'll spare you the gory details because no one wants that running through their brain as they try to enjoy Sunday lunch. Um, 
but there was an, a semi-emergency Caesar and, uh, and Joe wasn't looking good. And all three of the doctors, when you have a Caesar, there are three very clever people called doctors with very fancy degrees that are meant to know what they're doing. But all three of them were in a complete panic, uh, totally antsy, running around. Um, you know, Sarah wasn't well, Joe wasn't well at all. So at one point, Sarah asked me, after Joe had come out, uh, you know, you expect congratulations, well done, da, da, da. none of that was just, just very cold because they were worried. So Sarah asked me at one point, uh, where's Joseph? How is he doing? She asked me. How is he doing? And this is what went through my head. I'm not going to answer that question because I don't want her last thought to be that her son's also going to die. Uh, it was terrible. There I was confronted with a, what seemed to me like the fact uh, of death. I realized so quickly something you should all know if you don't already, that life is precarious and fragile, and it can go from you just like that. So I say to you, as somebody who is going to die, to a bunch of people who are going to die, I ask you, have you made peace with your death? Have you thought about it? And has the peace that you've made with your death filled your life with greater joy, greater contentment, and greater purpose? I want to work towards a conclusion. And I realize that sitting here this morning, maybe some people who, do, who are not Christians, you know, you don't believe in Jesus. Uh, your faith is not in Him. And I want to say to all of you, uh, to those who are here like that this morning, that you're in the right place at the right time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sitting all through all of our strange Christianese uh, and our funny little habits. Uh, well done. <laughs> it's tough, I know. Um, I want to ask you, if you're a seeker or an agnostic or someone with questions about the world, I want to ask you, have you noticed that life is an incomprehensible muddle? Have you noticed that? Surely you have sometime reached the point where you can't make sense of it all and where there just have to be loose ends because there are loose ends and where there are mysteries and you can't think your way out of them. Have you made peace with that? How can you make peace with that? I want to invite you to Christ. I want to say to you that in Christ, one thing we know sure, that He has revealed to us God in His saving righteousness, who is known by faith. I think that's a better solution than any of the other ones you could come up with. And I want to ask you, if you've thought about death, surely you must know you are going to die. If you're seeking or you're agnostic or you're wondering about the nature of ultimate reality, surely you must have realized that part of the story is that you are going to die. Have you thought about that? Have you realized that? Has the penny dropped in your heart and in your soul and in your mind? How do you make peace with that? How do you live with a world like that? I want to invite you to know that in Christ... There is such a thing as resurrection, salvation from out of the grave. I want to invite you to make peace with death in Christ. So I will be around afterwards, <laughs> and I'd be honored to talk with you more about that if uh, the person I'm describing is you. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks that we know you as Father in Christ, that we know you as Savior in Christ. Uh, we want to thank you that in Jesus Christ you have defeated death and overcome the grave. Father, we pray that in those truths, that in our Lord Jesus Christ, we might be people who have made peace with some of life's greatest difficulties, mystery and death. 
Uh, Father, we pray that in Christ we would be content and joyful and purposeful people. Not because we have all the problems solved, but because we're willing to sit with Him in our problems and our questions. Amen.